How many of you have heard of the butterfly effect? I'm just curious. If you can raise your hands. I would say like 10-15% of the audience has raised its hands. The butterfly effect uh, is actually something to do with mathematics. It's a part of, believe it or not, chaos theory. And what it, what it tells us is that small causes can have large effects. And the butterfly effect was first propounded back in the 1960s, and the story is actually pretty interesting. When computers were first introduced to attempt to predict weather changes based on initial data conditions, one of the programmers who was testing out um, a, 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 a model forgot to add a 0 .0001 value to one of the initial inputs about whether it was a barometer pressure or something. He made a mistake at the fifth digit level and he allowed the computer to churn out predictions for the next few weeks. Then when he realized his error, he went back and he put in the right numbers and he did the same calculations. And he was shocked to see the difference at a fifth degree decimal was so markedly different that he said this couldn't be possible. There must be something wrong. So he went back and he did both of the experiments and he realized that no, there is nothing wrong. In fact, if you begin with a change of literally 0 0.0001, then the impact over the next few weeks will be so different that you're gonna to come to two totally, radically different scenarios. And it was then called the butterfly effect to be a little bit more melodramatic because they, they tried to say that if the tip of the wing of a butterfly in Peru, for example, moved, eventually over the course of the next few months, it might potentially cause a tidal wave in Malaysia. If a moth flew in a certain direction, eventually a tornado would happen in Texas. Now, they're being a little bit exaggerated here because it's not that the butterfly's wing caused the tsunami, but put together with a million other factors, if the butterfly had turned left rather than right, in all likelihood the tsunami might not have happened. The point is, it's one of a lot of factors that sets into motion events that will eventually culminate very differently if those initial motions were not set into event. Why am I beginning an Islamic lecture with something of chaos theory and mathematics? Well, because we as Muslims, we actually have no problems affirming this concept as long as we add the caveat that with the permission of Allah, these changes can occur. And the notion of the butterfly effect, the concept of it, is actually something that gives us hope in this very chaotic world. It gives us meaning, it empowers us, and it makes us feel that, you know what? I can, inshallah ta'ala, cause a change whose impact is going to be far greater than even what I myself can see. The smallest good deed, the smallest change that I found effects, maybe even in world history, maybe even the course of history might change. And you know, if you study the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ, if you study the biographies of the earlier prophets, if you study the stories of the Sahaba, you come across these mini butterfly effects throughout the entire series. And what that does is that it makes you feel, you know what, maybe inshallah ta'ala, I better stop worrying about the consequences and start worrying about what I'm doing. Let Allah decide where my actions are gonna go. Let Allah see the fruits of those actions. My job is to cause these mini butterfly effects everywhere that I go. And there are so many beautiful stories that I can share with you from the seerah, from the time of the prophets, from uh, the, the stories of the sahaba. I'll just mention two or three to give you some examples here. The point, of course, of this whole lecture is very simple. Never, ever trivialize any good that you can do. Never, ever concern yourself with the impact of a good deed. Because one good deed could literally change the course of history. I'll give you, as I said, two or three examples. One of the simplest examples is the story of Musa, Moses, and Fir'aun, Pharaoh. The story of Musa and Fir'aun. If you remember the story, Musa was being raised in the palace of the Pharaoh. And eventually when he um, you know, punched the uh, Egyptian and the, 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 the viziers turned against him, Pharaoh turned against him, so Musa flees for his life. Musa flees for his life, he runs away from Egypt and he has no food, no money, just the clothes on his back and he flees to the valley of Midian. 
the valley of Madian in the Quran. And he himself is a refugee. He himself doesn't even know where he's going to go. And imagine the fear, the panic, the uncertainty that Musa has. When he gets to the valley, as the Quran tells us, he sees a well that was surrounded by shepherds, jostling, shoving with one another, trying to feed their flock. And as the Quran tells us, there were two ladies with their flock away from the crowd. So he goes to them and he says, Ma khatbukuma? What is the matter with you? Qalata, they said, we cannot feed our sheep until the rest of these men leave. And by that time, there's hardly going to be any water left. And don't blame us. We don't have any money to hire a servant, and our father is very elderly. Musa, as we know, volunteered to help them out. Here is where one of those micro butterfly effects is taking place. Musa himself is a refugee. Musa himself has no money to give them. He can't donate anything for them. But he donates the one thing that he does have, and that is the sweat of his brow. He's physically strong. So he volunteers to take the flock, and he gives the sheep water, he hands the sheep back to the ladies, and then, like the Quran says, he walks away from them. No need to chit-chat, no need to do anything more. Keep it dignified and decent. He walks away from them, and he sits under a tree. And he makes that beautiful Quranic dua that I hope all of you memorize and make regularly. He said, O oh my Lord, I am a beggar to any good that you can give me. I'm a faqeer, I'm a beggar. Any good you can give me, I would love it. What happens? Musa did one act of charity. This is the butterfly effect. He fed goats and sheep. That's the good deed he did. Or you can say he helped out two ladies that needed to be helped. But how was the help to feed goats and sheep? What was the impact of that good deed? What happened? SubhanAllah. Within a few hours, one of them comes back. She's embarrassed. She's shy. And she says, my father's inviting you. He wants to thank you for what you have done. So they go to the house of the father, and overnight, subhanAllah, overnight, Musa has a career, he gets a salary, he gets a place to live, he gets a, a house, and on top of that, he gets a wife as well, mashallah, subhanAllah. Single brothers, if you want to get married, start feeding water to the people outside. <laughs> this is the effect of a good deed. Do you think Musa understood any of this when he volunteered to help these ladies out? He didn't even know where he's going to go tomorrow. But when he was generous, Allah was generous to him. When he did a good deed, the butterfly effect comes into, into effect here. And he has no idea the consequences of his actions, what's going to happen. But subhanAllah, everything opens up. Another story, the story of Khalid ibn Walid the greatest general that Islam has ever seen, the one who helped the conquest of Palestine, of Jerusalem, of Qadisiyya, the one who participated in fighting against the Sassanids in Persia, the greatest military general who never once suffered any defeat in any battle that he fought. We all know the legend of Khalid ibn Walid. What many of us don't know is the story of this conversion and the fact that there was a very instrumental player in this conversion story. And had it not been for this person, maybe we would never have had Khalid ibn Walid. And that person was his older brother, Al-Walid ibn Al-Walid. His father and someone like this, Al-Walid ibn Al-Walid. The brother was called Al-Walid and the father was also Walid. So the Walid, the son of Walid. His older brother, Walid, actually converted to Islam before Khalid. And he was writing letters to Khalid all the time, inviting him to Islam. But Khalid wasn't interested. And even that story is very interesting. I don't have time to go into all of it, but I've given a longer lecture on Khalid al-Walid, and you can listen to it online. It's a very beautiful story. 
Al-Walid, the brother, was always interested in guiding his brother to Islam. He would write letters to him, he would give him da'wah, but was no use in battle. Then, his father had died, Khalid's father dies, Walid's father dies, so Walid and Khalid are now left without a father. So then, in the Treaty of Hudaybiyyah, the Muslims agree with the Quraysh that they're going to be allowed access to Mecca for three days the next year to do the Qawaa, to do the Sa'i, to do the pilgrimage. So in the seventh year of the Hijrah, Al-Walid has not seen his brother Khalid for six years. They haven't seen each other for six years. Al-Walid is missing his brother. In the seventh year of the Hijrah, the Muslims perform the Umrah in Mecca. And Walid rushes to the house of Khalid, hoping to see Khalid. But Khalid had decided to opt out of staying in Mecca. He didn't want to see the Muslims. So Khalid had left the house and camped outside for three days. He didn't want to see the Muslims. So Al-Walid was heartbroken. Now it's going to happen one of those small micro-incidents, the butterfly effect. Al-Walid wrote a very moving, emotional letter to his brother. And he left it in the house for Walid, for Khalid to find. Al-Walid wrote a letter from the heart to the heart. And he begged his brother to think about life. What are you doing? For how long will you worship these false gods? Worship Allah, you know Allah is our creator. You know the process is not a liar. It was emotional and blunt and frank. And he said, convert, come to Medina, and I promise you, you shall be honored. We will take care of you. We will treat you with respect, and I have the guarantee of the process. I ask him, I beg on your behalf. Because by the way, who was Khalid? Khalid was the one who caused the disaster of Uhud. Khalid was the one who even in the battle of the trench had done something. So Khalid was somebody whom he also felt, I can't convert, I'm going to be you know, punished or whatnot. Al-Walid argued on his behalf. Al-Walid got a concession from the process, and he got a promise. If Khalid converts, we're going to protect him, we're going to honor him. All of this is happening behind the scenes. Muslims, most of you have no clue about his brother. But see, here's the point, Allah does. And Allah will reward him. And had it not been for his brother, frankly, we would not be sitting here the way that we are right now. His brother was the one Allah used to guide Khalid to Islam. That letter was the last thing Khalid needed to convert to Islam. It was an emotional breakdown for him. He hadn't seen his brother for seven years. Now he's in his house. He writes a letter. Why did you leave us? I wanted to see you. Where were you? You know, I haven't seen we're brothers. Do you remember this and that? Very emotional letter from the heart to the heart. And then a blunt call to convert at the end. How long are you going to avoid this? Come and convert to Islam. Be a good Muslim. And I promise you, you will be forgiven and you will be honored in Medina. The Prophet says of his promise, he's going to honor you. So Khalid ibn al-Walid, he decided to convert to Islam, and he became the last convert before the conquest of Mecca. The last convert to actually migrate from Mecca to Medina, the last convert, you know we call those converts the Muhajir versus the Ansar. The last Muhajir is Khalid ibn walid because after him the conquest took place, so there's no more migration after that. And Khalid eventually did convert, and he came to Medina, and the rest, as they say, is history. But here's the point. When al Walid is doing what he's doing, do you think he has any idea that he's thinking about the future? He's thinking about the Sassanid Empire, and Persia, and Rome, and Byzantine. He's thinking about Qadisiyah. He wouldn't even know Qadisiyah. He wouldn't even know these battles. He wouldn't even know what's going to happen in the future. It's not on his mind. But that's the point. Allah is not asking you to calculate the net result of all that's going to happen. Allah is asking you, do you do your job? You spread khair and good and blessings wherever you go. You do your micro acts of good. And who knows, one of them might go and literally change the course of history. That letter that Walid wrote for his brother literally changed the course of human history. Think about that. He did it. Well, he didn't think about that, but that's not his job. That's not his job. His job is to do whatever he can with whatever he has, and Allah will take care of the rest. And that is exactly what he did. And so the rewards of Khalid and Walid and all that he did shall also be given a share of it to his brother Walid. So the conquest of Islam and Walid, we are also indebted to him, even though none of you know the story. Think about that. 
These are those micro acts of the butterfly effect, as you call it, where we see people doing things, and only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the future that's going to happen. And of course, there are so many incidents, even from uh, the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as well, where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam might even have done something, and even he does not realize the impact of what he's done. And again, time is limited. I'll just share one story with you. It's one of my favorite stories, and I've said this in quite a few lectures, because it really demonstrates the power of just doing good without waiting for the repercussions. You just do good and let Allah take care of the extra good that's going to come out of it. And this story involves the migration of the Prophet ﷺ to Medina. When our Prophet ﷺ in the last phases of Mecca realized that he needed to migrate to another city, when he realized that he couldn't live in Mecca for too long, he started approaching the other tribes, trying to get some tribe to sponsor him, trying to get some tribe to get him you know, away from the Quraysh. And he would go and target the famous tribes, the powerful tribes. It made sense. You target the tribes that are established. He would target the Hawaz and the Kindan. These are names of tribes that have tens of thousands of people. They have large settlements. And one day, as he's laying out his plan, and Abu Bakr was his main secretary, and saying, okay, we're gonna go today to this tribe, or we're gonna go to that tribe. And he mentions two of the big tribes they're gonna talk to. And the goal of talking to them was to see if they would be willing for the Prophet to migrate from Makkah to their lands. So one day, they have the agenda between tribe A and tribe B. And these are big, massive tribes. And as they're walking, the Prophet sees a group of five people sitting in the middle of nowhere in Mina in the days of Hajj. And he asks, who are you? They said, oh, we are from the tribe of the Khazraj. Khazraj. This isn't one of the big names. It's not one of the famous tribes. Even the process of his brain is thinking, Khazraj, which Khazraj? Oh, the Khazraj of Yathrib. Is that Khazraj? The Khazraj of the city of Yathrib. Remember, Medina was called Yathrib before it was called Medina. The Khazraj of Yathrib. They said, yes, yes, the Khazraj of Yathrib, that one. So the Prophet said, can I sit with you? Do you have some time? They said, sure, sit down. Realize, this wasn't on the agenda. The Khazraj was not on the plan. The plan was the big tribes, the fancy tribes, and that makes sense. When you want to approach people for protection, you go to the big shops. Total sense. But here's the point. Now you have an opportunity to do some good. Do it. Let Allah take care of the business. The Prophet sat down with the Khazraj. He gave them the call to Islam. With the same passion, the same sincerity, the same pure ikhlas that only he has, that he also gave to the larger tribes. And they thanked him, and life went on. He didn't even think about that. Life goes on. But subhanAllah, as we all know where this is heading, that small seed of Islam that was planted in those people quite literally changed the course of history. Those five people, they went back. Some of them converted. And they began preaching to their fellow tribesmen in Yathrib. The next year, 70 people came as Muslims. The next year, they demanded the Prophet to come back with us. For how long will you be persecuted in Mecca? We shall take care of you. So much so, when the Prophet preached to them, those five people, Allah showed him a dream. And he showed him the city of Medina. And Allah said to the Prophet in a dream, this is where you're going to migrate. But the Prophet didn't put one plus one together. He didn't, put, he didn't think of the Khazraj. And he thought maybe the people of Yemen that I had spoken to, the big guys, one of those big tribes, they're going to convert. Because Yemen was also green and luscious. When he saw Medina, he didn't see a name plate of Medina. He saw date palms and he saw water wells. And that's not Mecca. And the voice said to him, This is where you're going to migrate. The Prophet said, When I saw the dream, my imagination and my desires went to Yemen. But lo and behold, it turned out it was Yadrib or Medina. Meaning, even the Prophet did not recognize what had just happened with the Khazraj. He didn't recognize it until the Khazraj came back and they then said, you're going to come with us. We're not going to let you be persecuted. We're not going to let the Muslims be killed in Mecca. We will give you our safety and our promise. And the rest, as we quite literally know, is history. Literally, the 
history of Islam changed because of the hijrah, because from weakness to power, from having no state to being the leader of the state, etc., etc. How did that begin? Once again, there's this minor act over here, and that is the act of preaching to people that weren't even on the agenda. An opportunity came to do good, and the Prophet ﷺ did it. And there are many ayat and hadith that mention the, the magnificent impact that a small good deed can have. For example, the hadith in Sahih Bukhari mentions that the Prophet ﷺ said that if one of you gives a small date in charity from his pure wealth, a date that he wants, he loves, he's earned it, and he gives it in charity, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will accept that date, and he shall plant it, and nurture it, and water it, and it will grow, and grow, and grow, so much so, that when on judgment day you come back, and you see this beautiful tree in your good deeds, you might say, oh Allah, I don't recognize this good deed, I, don't, I didn't do this, where is this coming from? And Allah will say, remember that one date you gave? Remember that one date you gave, but your heart was pure, you had sincerity, you gave it for the sake of Allah? I accepted that date and I nurtured it. I allowed it to grow until the results of it is what you are seeing here. Our scholars say that perhaps what could happen is that you feed somebody and you don't realize what happens after that. You change his life around. You give somebody $10, in reality you change his entire life. He goes on and he does something else and all of the reward are gonna go to you and so on and so forth. One good deed is the domino effect might bring about thousands of other good deeds such that when you stand on judgment day you will have good deeds you don't even know where you're coming from because you used every opportunity you could to spread the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brothers and sisters the reason I'm, I'm, I'm talking about this is very simple we see global changes taking place we see the rise of Islamophobia as we speak now, massacres are taking place in Palestine. 15 people were killed brutally by the idea. 2,000 people were, were, were injured yesterday and today. This is happening right now. Major problems happening. At some level, we can't help but get depressed. At some level, it seems overwhelming. What can I do? What can I do? 7 million refugees in Syria. 500,000 Burmese people, you know, Muslims, Rohingya, being killed in massacre. What can I do? And the response is, I'm not telling you not to feel sad, we should feel sad. But we can do much good at the microcosm level. And the good that we do, we should never underestimate how it might impact other lives. We should never underestimate what might happen when that good is multiplied, accrued, when that good becomes too good, that too good becomes four, that four becomes 16, and slowly but surely, you change one person's life. What if that next person is our next Khalid al Wali? You change, you, could, you help one person accept Islam. What if that one person is the one person at, at whose hands Islamophobia will be demolished from this woman? You don't know that. You do not know that. We see this over and over again, even in our own lives. You all know last year, that video that went viral of one of our brothers in Atlanta breaking up a street fight. You all know that video, right? Uh, one of our African-American brothers, he saw a street fight, and he just walked out. He didn't know it's being videotaped. He didn't know it's going to become national news. He didn't know he would be interviewed by some of the greatest you know, TV stars and personalities in America, and that funds would be set up in his name. He had no clue. But what he did know was that as a, Muslim, as a Muslim, he couldn't allow this to happen. As a Muslim, he intervened, not knowing that somebody's videotaping it, subhanAllah. This is what you call sincerity. Allah blessed that sincerity. He got involved, he stopped that street fight, and what happened, you all know what happened after that. That was a sign of what it means to be a Muslim. And this is the reality that we see around us. So don't feel overwhelmed at all the negative stuff. Rather, look at the positives you can do. And let those positives go their own way. It is possible, brothers and sisters, that the good that you do will not even be known to you. And that is the best type of good. You don't even want to know it. Allah knows. Allah will connect the dots and you shall get the reward and the credit. That is the ultimate good. Your job is very simple, brothers and sisters, and with this I conclude. Your job is very simple. 
You're not required to solve the Palestinian problem that's too big. You're not required to solve all the poverty, all the hunger. You can't do that. No, Allah is not requiring you to take on these global challenges. Do what you can with what you have, wherever you are. That is all that Allah requires of you. Do what you can with what you have, wherever you are. That is all that Allah requires of you. Be good, be kind, be compassionate. Wherever you go, bring about that happiness, bring about that khair, donate to people, smile in their face, be a positive influence at the micro level. And guess what? Eventually that positive influence at the micro level will cause about a positive influence at the macro level. And that is the goal that we can strive to do. You might not know it. You might not causally link it together. But that's not your job. It's not your job to put all the dots together. Allah will take care of where the domino goes. Allah will take care of all of those causes. Your job is to spread that. Your job is to plant the seeds wherever you go. And on Judgment Day, when you come and you see these magnificent trees and you ask Allah, oh Allah, where did that come from? You will want to hear from Allah. Remember that day you did this? That's the cause of this. Remember that day you did that? That's the result of that. And inshallah ta'ala, if you do that, then you have succeeded even if the world does not see your success, Allah has seen your success. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of the success.